And yes, we are joined at this moment by Tony Khan, who you can all see in beautiful HD here. He cannot see us. We like to keep this as creepy as possible. <laughs> Tony, how are you doing here today? I'm great. I'm great. Like I said in the commercial break, I feel like I'm on like Ed TV or The Truman Show with you guys oh, right now. But little do you know. Very cool. Mike, have we ever talked before on the show? I don't think we have, right? No, we have not. This is the first time. First time for everything. But it's not the first time we've talked. It is not. Because I was on the Death Valley Driver with you 20 years ago. Oh, my God. Tony, seriously, where were you? Okay, like we know that you were you were part of the Observer site, and people have found a, a post or two here on the board, if I recall correctly. But, I mean... You're you're younger than we are, but you've been around forever. And I don't know, you know, we have younger listeners, but the Death Valley Driver Board. I mean, <laughs> where else were you lurking around this internet before becoming this Tony Khan? Uh, America Online, the grandstand. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of great people on in like the mid '90s, and it's great having Brian Pillman Jr. here. And I got the chance to talk to Brian Pillman Sr. on AOL pretty regularly and uh, DDP, who I also now get to talk to in real life. And uh, the great Luthez was on AOL. And there were a lot of big wrestling fans on the grandstand. And uh, I went to ECW and met a lot of the guys in the grandstand when I was 13 years old. And uh, then when I was like in high school and college, I was on the Death Valley driver a lot when like AOL was kind of fading out of existence. And um, I used to do the HTML for John McAdams' website. And wow. John McAdam had a tape trading page, and he used to pay me in tapes. And uh, that was pretty cool. And I haven't talked to John in a long time, but I think he has a show now, too. Um, and uh, there were a lot of great people on AOL. John Muse, I think, yeah. uh, is somebody who stays in touch with The Observer. I knew John Muse when I was a little kid, like 12, 13 years old. And he would talk about booking ideas and stuff like that. And uh, Mike was a guy I remember from the Death Valley Driver. My favorite uh, post I ever put on there was I did like a look at all of the tag teams and arguing who the better half of all the tag teams was. And I, there was like a long list of tag teams. And it was like, here's like, uh, and then uh, it was uh, not to, uh, do you remember the Lance Storm thing, Mike? The Lance, Lance of the Day? God, the Lance Actually, of the I day? vaguely remember this. Yeah, it was like every day there was a different like Lance Storm is Lance Storm better than this this person. Yes, and it was like <laughs> now Tony, hold like, on, I got to ask you a question here. Were you one of those people that were convinced that like Mark Henry was the best worker in the world because he went and had like a great match with with <laughs> Kurt Angle? It's no? like dumb now. I think it's so dumb to like argue this stuff. Like, but like at the time, no, I wouldn't have argued that necessarily. But I think Mark's great and does a great job. But I guess my, the point of it was more, I never said a word about any of this stuff. And I think these arguments are generally dumb. But like Robert Gibson's name came into it. And I was like, Robert Gibson? Like, what are we talking about? Robert Gibson's so great. He's like one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, in my opinion. And I was like, how did he get like brought into this where he lost? And I was like, I think Lance Storm's great. But it was like such an overwhelming percentage of people voted against Robert Gibson that I felt like I had to defend Robert Gibson. And then it turned into a whole list of uh, tag teams where, you know, uh, I thought that for, <laughs> it, 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 it turned into a list of tag teams where I thought that the commonly believed lesser half of the tag team was uh, still – going to be better than Lance. Were you, were you <laughs> arguing that Jim better. Neidhart was better than Brett the Hitman Hart? <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. It wasn't any crazy stuff, any crazy debates like that. It was more like the interesting ones. Like, I thought, like, I like, in a vacuum, I like Rick Martell and Tito Santana, but, like, in their team, I think Tito Santana probably in that team brought more to that version of the team sure. because he was more versatile as a babyface tag team wrestler. But, like, it's all, but it was, like, all of that, these subjective debates. Uh, and, like, uh, I'm a huge fan of everyone I, like, was listing in it, but I just think it's fun doing subjective rankings and stuff like that. Probably the thing on Death Valley Driver that was the most famous thing was the sleaze thread. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now I got to uh, ask you, eight. there were a couple of those in the original F4W. Board no, well, that's too. not true, Mike. Don't don't <laughs> spread false rumors. Now, Tony, I got to ask because this plays into what you were just talking about. So obviously, you have been a fan forever, and you've got favorites, and now you're also, you know, you're in charge of AEW. Okay, so when you're booking, I've mentioned this many times. I have heard that one of Vince McMahon's personal favorite wrestlers that he loves to watch is William Regal. But he never did anything with William Regal. Like, Regal was never the champion. Regal maybe had a secondary title here or there, but he never... Because I guess in his mind, he was like, well, I like him, but I don't necessarily think that he would do much for business, okay? Do you think that's what the King of the Ring was about before uh, Lord Regal had to take some time off? Uh, well, I mean, because I think that King of the Ring, it felt like they were really about to do it, like pull the trigger. Sure, but they did they did things the with him night. in a secondary per- position, but like he was never going to be the champion is my point. So I guess I felt like they were ready that when he won that King of the Ring because he beat three guys in one night on Raw and it felt like they were like, I think this was 2008. It was either 07 or 08, definitely 07 or 08. I think it was 2008. It felt like they were going to pull the trigger on him and they didn't. Do you, you remember what I'm talking about when he won the King of the Ring? I, I, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, And then he had to take some time off like right after that. I felt like that was because I'd been, you know, I agree with you. I love Lord Regal and I've been waiting for them to kind of go with him for a long time. And uh, I thought that was when it was going to happen maybe but, but, but my, uh, my question i didn't know that i didn't know that that was somebody that was one of vince's personal favorites if i had uh you know my, my wares uh we would have you know gotten to use buddy landell in AEW because i'm sure. a huge buddy landell fan i grew up awesome. uh, idolizing buddy landell but um, my question my question it, off of this is so you i i have heard before that there has been maybe an AEW show here and there that did a that didn't do a great number, and then what you figured was, well, the lineup. It was just not a star-studded lineup. So my question is: Are there is do you book like that? Do you book matches where it's like, well, this is a match I really want to see, so I'm going to headline with it, whether I think it's going to do like a great number or not, or do you also do you hyper focus on, yeah. well, I like this yeah. match, but it's not going to do a number, so I'm not going to do the match. It's definitely a great question, Brian. There's a balance between the two. This week's show might be more of the former. <laughs> I, don't, well, I hope we do a great number. I really believe in the main event this week that Lance Archer versus Phoenix is an important match for us. These are two of our top wrestlers, and I believe that even though they haven't been signature box office stars across America and uh, international television week in, week out, for AEW in the past, the fact is these are going to be two of the most important wrestlers for us in the future. And recently they've been in the main events in tag matches. And I felt like with Phoenix and Lance Archer in a singles match, this is a huge match for us. There's stakes on the match. The winner of the match will be in the face of the revolution ladder match. It's a crazy important time for AEW right now going into revolution uh, these shows are really important to us. The TV time is really important. And those guys are both really important to us. I think Lance Archer versus Phoenix is just an awesome, awesome match. And Phoenix right now is one of the hottest wrestlers in the world. And Lance right now has been in the huge main events for us. And Lance was at one point probably our hottest wrestler. And I think he's gotten back to where he was these last several weeks. His performance in the street fight, the Falls Count Anywhere match with – Kenny Omega and Kenta with Lance teaming with Mox, I thought was tremendous. Lance and Phoenix have been a great team recently, and we only had one spot for between the two of them in this ladder match, and uh, it's a great, great match for us. So that's a match that's two of my personal favorites. So uh, some weeks you're going to see a match that I just think is going to be an awesome, awesome match, and it's not about – uh, just trying to pull the biggest number, but really it's all about uh, at the end of the day, trying to keep dynamite strong, trying to keep AEW strong, trying to keep our different properties strong. And right now we're expanding. I think this week I'll have some more news uh, about more platforms, more properties. We've already announced in the past week that we've got a special on bleacher report, which is a really big deal for us. Um, and uh, I just really, really, wish that uh 
you know, we were able to do it with full house, full capacities, but it's not really safe to do that. But when it is safe to sell all the tickets and not just sell 25%, 30% of the seats and uh, do the things we've been doing to keep the fans safe when it's ruined or ready to pack the houses again, I can't wait for that. But what's really awesome is the past year, the audience we've had, we've made new fans. We've introduced new fans to wrestling through the pandemic, which is pretty amazing because at the beginning of this, I don't know if anybody knew how long it would last or if anybody wanted to believe how long it was going to last. But the fact is we've prospered through it and we've persevered and um, done it with a lot of great matches along the way, trying to build for the future. So my long-winded answer to your question is like, yes and no, it's a balance between the two. Like you have to do matches uh, based on what's going to do a good number, but sometimes you can do dream matches. And this is an example of where the two guys have been box office guys. They've been in big matches for us, but for the two of them to go one-on-one on on the big stage, it's a big moment. I think they're going to do really well with it. All right. Stand by everybody. We're going to head to a break back with more with Tony Khan Wrestling Observer Live. Show Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Tony Khan is joining us here today. We're going to go to Mike in a second. He's going to ask Tony if he has anything he can add to the sleeves thread. But before that, <laughs> we got a pay-per-view coming up. Young Bucks versus the Inner Circle for the AEW World Tag Team titles. Team Taz versus Darby Allen and Sting in a street fight. Karshida versus the winner of the AEW Women's World Championship Eliminator Tournament for the women's title. Adam Page versus Matt Hardy in a big money match. Cody, Scorpio Sky, Penta, Lance Archer, Ray Phoenix, and two others. In the face well, of we the... don't know. We don't know whether it's Lance Archer or Ray Phoenix. It's only going to be one or the other. I can true. promise you they both. it's not going to be both of them. That's true. That's true. I apologize. I don't know if it's going to be Ray Phoenix or Lance Archer, but one of them will be in that match. And Kenny Omega. And we'll versus... find out tomorrow night. Tomorrow on night on Dynamite, everybody, which airs on TNT. And uh, Kenny Omega, John Moxley. Yes, Mike, go ahead. Well, you know, he's brought up Lance Archer's names. Uh, one of his biggest opponents so far in AEW, Eddie Kingston, who has been a longtime favorite, as you know, Tony, being on the internet for a long time. There's been a lot of people that were hoping Eddie Kingston was going to get his break. AEW has given him his break, and he has taken the ball, and I, I believe ran with it and scored several times. Who are some people that you may have thought or, or we may have thought in the general public that the die was cast on your Tynera Contes, people like that and people that didn't get the opportunity or haven't gotten an opportunity. Can you talk about some of these people that you've given the opportunity to that have taken the ball and ran with it like Kingston, like maybe some others that have come over from NXT that maybe didn't advance there in the way that they uh, probably should have under the system. That's a great question. It's a great question. I think, uh, well, Ty Conti is a, a great example of somebody who I've always thought looked like a star. Um, I went to uh, a house show, an NXT house show, uh, like four years ago in Jacksonville, and I thought that Ty Conti looked like she'd be a great star then. She had such char- charisma and personality, and she was working as a manager. And as a manager, she had that much charisma. And de- she's developed so much in the past few years as a wrestler. I'm really excited about Ty Conti. I'm glad you brought her name up. I think Eddie Kingston's a great example of somebody that I wanted to see get a chance in AEW. Um, Eddie Kingston and Ricky Starks threw the TNT title open challenge when Cody had the title and was doing the open challenge. Uh, he and I went through a list, and in the pandemic, it was really exciting to be able to open up and look at different people. And there were some names that on his original list of ideas, Cody had these great ideas. And two of the people that he had on his list of guys that he liked were Ricky Starks and Eddie Kingston. And those were my two favorite names on his list by far. And I said, let's definitely bring those two. There were some other guys on the list that are indie guys that are nice independent wrestlers that I just didn't think would fit in on dynamite. But I really believed that Eddie Kingston or Ricky Starks had a chance to make it. And I watched both their matches very closely. And while they were in the ring with Cody, I decided I was going to sign both guys. And the truth is, with Ricky Starks, I already knew what I was going to do with him. And I hadn't figured it out until he was actually in the ring. And then when he was in the ring, it kind of clicked. And I was like, oh, man, this is the guy for, for Taz and Brian. This is the guy to be their partner against Moxley and Darby. 
and their partner long term. And this is the other member of Team Taz. I was really excited about it. And with Eddie, I didn't have an idea right away for him, but I knew he was going to be important to us. I wanted him to stay, and I told him that as soon as he came back. And uh, I really believe that Eddie's become such an important part of the show for us, and uh, he's such an important part of AEW. And when Pac had been unavailable for a long time, we had done uh, an eight-man tag with Phoenix and Penta and the Butcher and the Blade against the Young Bucks and FTR. And the Lucha Brothers and the Butcher and the Blade won the match. And it, it was like, well, we're on to something with these guys together. And then I realized, well, until Pac comes back, I could put Butcher, Blade, and the Lucha Brothers with Eddie. Eddie could do the talking, and we can set up a story, build it, for when Ben's ready to come back and this whole thing blows up. And then we can reassemble the Death Triangle. And that, you know, we, we've done that, and they've had some great matches. And uh, for me, I really think that um, Eddie, you know, coming in, it was fate. It, but really, one of the best examples of this all working out was um, I had put together the uh, order for the Battle Royal at All Out, for the Casino Battle Royale, and really believed in Lance and uh, Eddie Kingston as the final two guys. And uh, with then Lance, in the run-up to his – story with mox lance had got COVID, so eddie was available and john and i were thinking the same thing we were already planning to build towards john versus eddie anyway and i had uh done the and i i it's john and i are often on the same page on stuff without actually having to talk and so uh i you know put the battle royal together and he had um a match with mjf that night and i had a drink with him after the show and then he was catching up on everything, and he was like, he loved what I had done with the Battle Royal and obviously knew what I was had, you know, kind of thinking on the back burner that there was a future with him and Eddie. And obviously, him and Lance had an immediate program. And, you know, when Lance had COVID, and like I said, Lance, to me right now, is gotten back to where he was as hot as he was back then because he's been in this run of main event matches like that street fight, a false count anywhere match. Uh, with Kenny and Kenta and Mox and in some great tag matches teaming with Phoenix that is really where they're in this position to be in this great main event match tomorrow night on Dynamite um, that uh, Lance and Eddie out there at the end would be great when Lance caught COVID immediately John and I were both completely on the same page we have to go with Eddie and uh, you know he said that's what I want to do and I told him well it's a, we're already that's great because I was already going to do it. So I'm glad, I'm glad that's what you want to do because we're completely on the same page. So, um, and, uh, you know, for me, um, Eddie coming back and, and being a part of the show and then uh, doing commentary, interviews, being a wrestler manager, he's done so many different things for us. And I'm really happy for him, but I'm really thankful for him too. And uh, those guys are great examples of that. Uh, as far as some other examples of people that have been around and, uh, you know, just maybe didn't get utilized, I think the best friends are a great example. Trent um, had been in the Dude Busters, and then I really was a huge fan of Rapungi Vice in New Japan with Trent and Rocky Romero. And Chuck Taylor was a top independent wrestler, top guy for PWG and a bunch of indies, and super well respected among the hardcore fans. Orange Cassidy, I didn't know as well as Orange Cassidy. And one of the things that got me really excited about him was when I found out he was the fire ant because I didn't realize they were the same person. And I was almost shocked to realize they were the same person. And then if you look at... Did you know Luke Gallows was once Festus? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I knew that. I don't think the person who made him that knew that, but I knew that. Just checking. (laughs) I was I I think that's one of my favorite stories that he didn't realize they were the same guy. Um but uh you know, for me, uh yeah, I, I think with uh, Orange I had no idea that he was a fire ant. And I think Orange Cassidy and the best friends are guys that have become huge in wrestling. Um each of the three of them has had probably individually been overlooked and uh they've become a great act and I can't wait till Trent is healthy again because they were pretty much there on the verge of being uh, top guys 
before Tony, he got hurt and you it you brought up the right back. Up. I've got to ask you this, just because you were you you were so happy, and I know I'm sure a lot of it had to do with discussions with New Japan before this, but you were very happy when you signed uh, Trent and Chuck over. And I was curious, is there anything you had to tell? Because Beretta was, in theory, from how it sounded, he had somebody that New Japan had eyes on. He definitely had a place there, and he is going to you a place. Do you know the story? That, Do you know the story? Well, is that what you're asking the question? Well, well, well the what I kind of want to know is, did you have to – do any extra convincing for him or i mean how because he was going to leave a safe spot and go to something that at the time again we don't we didn't know where things were going to go exactly for AEW. did it take any extra cajoling and exactly how did that work out because it it was a big deal when they signed obviously and they had a spot that was guaranteed and they were going to somewhere that was a question mark no that makes perfect sense i was i almost was like you were felt like you were reading my mind when i asked if you knew the story because like you hit the nail on the head yeah, Trent was probably the hardest person for me to convince that actually came. I spent a lot of time on the phone with a few people who really needed the extra convincing and of people I believed in and put the full court press on. That's the one. There are a couple other people that didn't come that made a huge mistake and should have listened to me, and they didn't. And he did, and he talk, we talk about it all the time, that I joke with him all the time that he made the right choice. Um Probably every single month I tell Greg that. And, um, you know, I, I'm a huge, huge Trent fan. I've been a believer in his for many, many, many years. And like I said, I was a huge fan of Rapungi Vice. And, you know, Trent and Chuck are guys that were in a position and, and they could have kept wrestling. And I think they would have fit into New Japan's plans and they would have been important people there. And that's something that he told me, exactly what you said that uh, they had plans for him and they wanted to keep him. And I told him, I have plans for you and I want you here. And I really believe in you and, you know, you'll be happier here. And he's he's been great and they've been a huge part of AEW. I think uh, they had one of the greatest wrestling matches I've ever seen on television, period, with Santana Ortiz. And I was so proud that they had it on Dynamite. And uh, I still really believe in him. I really believe in the best friends. And I'm very grateful Trent came. And, it, you know, like, like I said, there were other people that I liked. Maybe not quite as much as Trent, but there were other people I liked that I put the full court press on and they didn't listen. And uh, they wish they had. Now, I don't know how much of this question you want to answer, but as a promoter, obviously you want to make people very excited about the future, but you also don't want everybody on my chat expecting Okada to be at this pay-per-view. <laughs> So what can you tell us about the forbidden door, if anything? Well, I mean, don't, I, I, you know, I, let's manage expectations on the door. I think <laughs> uh, the forbidden door um, is open. The forbidden door means, I think, that anybody from any company could show up anywhere now. And the gloves are off. Um, and I'm really excited about it. I think with the, the pandemic, it's still makes it a little bit more challenging. If, if the Forbidden Door had been open like this a year ago uh, or more, then absolutely you could see anybody going anywhere any week. Now with quarantines and travel guidelines, there's a little bit more in terms of challenges getting people back and forth. I mean, if you remember, and a lot of people don't remember this, right before the pandemic started, you know, over a year ago, Mox was running a crazy schedule. It was not sustainable what John was doing because he was like coming back and forth between Japan and America like almost every other week. Um, and he was on Dynamite every week because we were doing the show every week live. And then he would go back to Japan like every other week. And it was a lot. And um, I don't know if travel is ever going to get back to where people are doing that that often again and making those kind of trips. But I do think it's not there yet. And with uh, – quarantines and travel guidelines and stuff it still presents challenges on travel but you know hopefully we can do some exciting things with this forbidden door now that it's been opened i think we can and uh we will so there's going to be people showing up could be people from new japan could be people from impact could be people from other companies uh could be new faces old faces but there's going to be a lot of changes and I'm really excited about it. And that's important in wrestling, you know, bringing new people in and, and consistently changing up the cards.
Well, stand by. Hold that thought back in just a moment. Observer Live. Here, Observer Live, Mike Semper Vivi, Tony Khan. We want to thank you so much for doing the show here today. We've got about a minute. There's a lot of stuff coming up between Dynamite and the Moxley's match on New Japan Strong this coming Sunday. The women, let's get it all out here. Well, it's a huge week of wrestling. I think tomorrow night on Dynamite, first of all, dark tonight. We've been putting top stars in streaming matches. You know, you've seen John Moxley, Pac, and now Orange Cassidy in recent weeks on dark tomorrow night dynamite is going to be a massive card i'm really excited about nyla rose versus Britt baker and the eliminator really excited about isaiah versus the hangman and hugely excited about phoenix versus archer mox and ken on new japan strong i'm really excited for that and then sunday you know it's important for us to establish on bleacher report it's a it's an important partnership for us hugely excited about rio versus thunder rosa sakazaki versus mizunami and the six woman tag on bleacher report which features Sheeta in the six-woman tag, and Maki Ito, and, and it's going to be a great match also. Uh, Thunder Rosa versus Rio, two of our top stars, and I think it's a great chance to establish viewing habits a week before Revolution. And then for everybody, Revolution uh, on March 7th, after that, the following Sunday, uh, Revolution last year I thought was the best show in all of wrestling, and we hope to follow that path and make this the best show so far in 2021. Well, if you want more, everybody, the easiest thing to do, follow Tony Khan on Twitter, at Tony Khan. What could be easier than that? And obviously, Dynamite, and as noted, New Japan Strong, Bleach Report on Sunday. I want to thank you so much for doing the show here today, and hopefully at some point we can have you back on again soon, because maybe there will be some news to talk about soon. You know what I'm talking about, Tony? There's good, I promise there will be a lot of news, and tomorrow I've got some news. That's right. So check it out, everybody, at Tony Khan on Twitter. Thanks so much for doing the show. We are out of time, everybody. I want to thank Mike, as always, callers and listeners up in the studio. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live. If you love these video clips, head down there to the bottom right-hand side of the screen and click Join. For just $7.99 per month, you get full access to all of the episodes, over 300 at current count, full-length episodes of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, and Figure Four Daily with both Landstorm and Filthy Tom Lawler. You can also hit that subscribe button, and you'll always be alerted as to when new shows are available.